This presentation is brought to you by Arizona State University's Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability and a generous investment by Julianne Wrigley. I think it's really nice to be here. Uh, can all of you hear me? Is this, this come through okay? You can't in the back? Do you want to? Uh, all right, uh, is that better? Uh, wave your hand if, if uh, uh, not if you don't like what I'm going to say, but if you can't hear it. Uh, I want to begin, I want to talk about sustainability, and I want to begin with the biggest issues uh, that we face, which uh, in my judgment is climate change. You cannot hear. All right, I'll tell you, Chuck, let me just use that one. Um, all right, is that, boom. <laughs> is that better? Okay, I want to talk about climate change and uh, politics, and I want to, as a kind of barometer of how far we have to go, I'm going to read a letter that was written to the uh, Arkansas Democrat. This was a serious letter. Uh, it was written last spring, so less than a year ago. It says, you may have noticed that March of this year was particularly hot. As a matter of fact, I understand it was the hottest March since the beginning of the last century. All the trees were fully leafed out, and legions of bugs and snakes were crawling around during a time in Arkansas when on a normal year we might see a snowflake or two. This should come as no surprise to any reasonable person. As you know, daylight saving time this year started almost a month early this year. You would think that members of Congress would have considered the warming effect that an extra hour of daylight would have on our climate. Or did they? Perhaps this is another plot by a liberal Congress to make us believe that global warming is a real threat. Perhaps next time there should be serious studies performed before Congress passes laws with such far-reaching effects. <laughs> hey, we've got our work cut out for us. And I want to begin, I want to talk about this. I'm going to describe uh, three things. I want to go through real quickly the science of climate change that I think is pertinent to a conversation like this. I want to describe the political challenges and then what happens beyond this. So, uh, let me begin, and this is going to be a little bit awkward because I've got a computer behind me who I need to communicate with, and I hope I can. Uh, this is going to require a change, just a second. Now I'm constrained by the, the length of my wires. Can you all just bear with me here? This is the... Um, This is what uh, has been called the perfect problem. And if you think about the components of this, uh, the problem is one of long term. It's one that invites uh, a lot of skepticism because the science is complicated. The uh, time lag between cause and effect is uh, maybe 30 or so years between the time we emit heat trapping gases to the effects that we see. Denial is real easy with this issue. It's so easy to say it's not really happening. Uh, it's not my problem. It's a uh, issue that has gotten caught up in the partisan disputes between right and left. It's a problem of uh, motivation and collective action. How do we summon the wherewithal to act collectively, especially when the, the main beneficiaries will be far into the future? And then it, puts, it pits nation against nation. It's a global, national kind of problem. So that if we, quote, sacrifice here, then uh, other countries, let's say the developed countries, are not sacrificing nearly as much. So uh, it's a real uh, uh, problem in more ways than I think we typically have faced. The cartoonist Walt Kelly had the, car, had the uh, Pogo cartoon. It was a great cartoon for many years. but. And one of the most famous of those cartoons, uh, Walt Kelly had Pogo say, we've met the enemy, 
and he's us. And that's the climate change problem. Carbon as a source of uh, energy or carbon-based fuels as the main power source for the society is insinuated in everything we do. It's how we eat, it's how we travel, it's how we uh, provide heat and warmth and so forth. Three curves. This is the Keeling curve. Uh, all of you have seen this many times before, but David Keeling went to Mauna Loa in 1958, and the carbon level in the atmosphere that he measured was about 315 parts per million. We're now at about 385 parts per million. This is the second curve. This is Swiss Re. This is the number of uh, climate-driven weather disasters that uh, uh, they chart and graph because they've got to pay the bills for these. This is a, a graph of hottest hots, wettest wets, driest dry, windiest wind conditions based on uh, lots of da different data. This appeared in that environmental rag, Fortune magazine. <laughs> this is a graphic from uh, the Stern Review, Nicholas Stern commissioned by the British Exchequer to uh, uh, describe the economics of climate change. And what he did here was really quite interesting. The, uh, the graphic starts off here with one degree, two degree, three degree, four degree centigrade changes and then a series of areas here, food, energy, water, ecosystem services, and so forth. So as the, the arrows go from yellow to orange to red, the, the issues become more severe. A couple things are interesting about the graphic. One is these things are self-contained, when in reality they're not self-contained. If we were to make a graphic that really worked here, you'd see lots of cross-hatch and connections. Obviously what happens to the hydrosphere affects food and disease and ecosystem services and so forth. The second thing to note here is that at one degree or less than one degree centigrade uh, warming, we're already seeing the effects of global warming appear to the left of where this particular graphic shows it. But still, this is other than the IPCC, this is one of the finest summations of the, the issue of climate change. The red line depicts where we are now at about eight-tenths of degree warming. This is what we've already done. And one of the great scientific uh, triumphs, I think, of the 20th century was the development of this science called thermometry. How do you take the temperature of a whole planet? Well, now we can do it with considerable reliability. This is what we're committed to, and it's a warming of another half a degree centigrade to maybe one full degree centigrade. But if we were to stop emitting heat trapping gases today, this is what we're now committed to, uh, to deal with. And then increasingly, the finely hatched line here depicts what I believe is a more or less consensus number that about two degrees centigrade warming is a threshold beyond which we, we really don't want to go. This is a, a lot, point of no return. But if it's 2 or 2.2 or 2.5 or 1.5, it's clear that we're, in terms of climate change, in the danger zone. This, uh, this graphic just summarizes uh, several things here. One is that uh, what Jim Hansen said several years ago that we had 10 years to solve climate change. He wasn't just talking about figuring it out. He was talking about starting deflection downward of heat trapping gases. And then there should be, uh, this is a, the wrong number here, but this, there should be something here that says we probably don't want to go past maybe 400 or 450 parts per million CO2 or CO2 equivalent. And then this number, two degrees centigrade warming, this appears to be the, the threshold. This is a graphic taken from the fourth report of the IPCC. You've all seen this, and this, there are some heat trapping gases that are on the positive side. There are some that retard the effect of uh, heat trapping, but the sum total is down here. The total forcing is roughly uh, about, uh, give or take, 1.5 watts per square meter uh, around the planet. The, the news that keeps coming out, and I'm an outsider that looks in at the science, but if you read Science Magazine or Nature or Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, there are a regular drumbeat of news. Most all of it is bad or it's worse than what was once thought before. This is a report that came out in this past fall, and the interesting take-home message you hear is that the amount of carbon going into the atmosphere is actually increasing and there is a decreasing effect of the, the sinks uh, uh, absorbing carbon. So the ocean uptake, for example, of carbon has dropped rather dramatically in the last uh, uh, few years. A couple other graphics, these are uh, again taken from the fourth IPCC report, and this uh, is the range of temperature uh, estimates uh, with error bars, no one knows exactly how hot, how much forcing results and how much warming, but 
we're in a danger zone, and this is again a graphic from IPCC. What does this mean? Well, one of the things it means is higher rainfall or more severe rainfall events. We had a, um, uh, two back-to-back -back four and a half inch rains in um, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, unprecedented. A tornado hit in Pittsburgh, a tornado hit in Brooklyn. These things are mostly unprecedented. This is from the consultative group on uh, international agriculture research. The area that is in yellow crosshats, this is the area where you can grow wheat now. In 2050, they say it'll be up in Canada. And of course, this is on the Canadian Shield where soils are a lot less uh, suitable for growing wheat. And then there are graphics like this. This is taken from the uh, science uh, uh, section of the New York Times every Tuesday. And this was uh, late last fall, but the rate of Arctic melting has been increasing and dramatically so. This was not reflected uh, in the third report of the IPCC and not adequately in the fourth report either. And the rate of melting has increased from 2005. Uh, one report has it roughly doubling what they thought in 2005. This is a, the Greenland ice sheet. Everything here in red is uh, subject to melting. And then there's the issue of sea level rise, what happens as seas rise and, and Arctic melting uh, continues in Greenland and the West Antarctic ice sheet. So the graphic or the metric is down here and you see areas, uh, New Orleans basically disappears and the, the lower Mississippi goes underwater. Uh, the same is true in, in Florida and along the, the coastal regions. Uh, at a six foot sea level rise, most of downtown Charleston, South Carolina goes underwater. So, uh, global warming? No, this isn't global warming. This is planetary destabilization. Radically different kind of thing. And so we know that sea levels arise from thermal expansion of water and from melting ice. We know that the uh, storms, perhaps the number of storms may or may not increase, but storm severity will certainly increase. That uh, is seemingly uh, known now. Disease and famine will change dramatically uh, and for the worse. Drought and heat waves become much more likely and probable. Changing ecosystems, the, uh, the forests of the southeast and the Appalachian uh, forests will begin to disappear apparently at present rates around 2050. Coral bleaching uh, affects now, I'm told, about half the uh, corals in the world. Uh, political and economic disorder will be uh, more frequent. Uh, the death toll uh, for, from climate change driven weather events uh, now, we're told, exceeds 150,000 people per per year. So here's the sum uh, of this. We're already committed to substantial warming, whether it's 1.4 to 1.8 degrees centigrade warming, but we're already committed to a very substantial warming of the Earth at a pace that is quite unprecedented. There's this lag between uh, cause and effect of roughly, say, 30 years at the time we emit heat-trapping gases to the same time we see the weather effects that, I'm told, will drop to 20 years because the uptake of carbon in the oceans will uh, decrease. Uh, and this is hard news. It's too late to avoid trauma. It's already too late for the people on the island of Tuvalu and parts of Alaska that are directly in the crosshairs of immediate climate change, but it is not too late to avoid the worst of what could otherwise lie ahead. Uh, there's no easy way out. Uh, there's no magic bullet solution. There is, in the words of uh, several writers, uh, silver buckshot, but no silver bullet that gets us out of the whole thing. And then finally, I think Al Gore had it right that this is the first planetary emergency since we've been on the planet as an identifiable species. Um, where do we have to go? Well, this is from Angela Merkel, the uh, chancellor of uh, Germany. And she argues that we have to go from 22 tons of carbon dioxide down to two tons per person. Uh, on average, Americans emit about 22 or 23 tons of CO2. We've got to go on a stringent carbon diet, 80, 90 percent kind of diet. And this is interesting because this is the, the uh, bargain uh, and the political dialogue, a good bit of the next uh, 50 years, will be around the nature of this bargain and how actually to get there. And the bargain is roughly that the third world countries and developing countries will allow us to survive, but in return for equity. And there's going to be some hard bargaining about how this occurs. But uh, any one of a number of countries, China built in 1,000 megawatts of coal-fired electricity per week, can bring, can tip the climate into a radically different state and one that we'll not like. Um, what do we do about this? And the second part of the talk is this. There are a number of us who've gathered around, about 100, 150 people have gathered around in an effort to uh, create a climate action plan for the next US administration, focusing specifically on the first 100 days of that administration. Uh, so the, we're patterning this after the, uh, the Roosevelt administration in 1933. 
No mind that the first 100 days of the Roosevelt administration weren't all that great, but we've taken that, uh, that focal point. And uh, you can go on the web at uh, climateactionplan.com and download the entire document. The final version will roll out in September of uh, 2008. Uh, we're making the, the document available and actually meeting with the, uh, the various presidential candidates that are willing to, uh, to meet with us. Um, in thinking about this, there are several assumptions that we've made in this. And this is one way, this is a, Gary Larson is one of my favorite cartoonists, but this is Larson's way of uh, describing the issue. Objects in the mirror are a whole lot closer than they appear. And what, one of the things that is driving us is the belief that climate change is severe, it is here, it's real, and it is a lot closer than we might otherwise uh, want to believe. Secondly, we've made an assumption that climate change isn't a matter of left or right. It's not a Republican issue or Democratic issue. It's a matter that affects all of us, left and right, liberal and conservative. And it really doesn't matter a great deal uh, what your politics are. And so we made an assumption this is an issue that, on which we need the support of liberals, we need the support of conservatives and independents, but this is an issue quite clearly that transcends politics. This is like World War II. Uh, it is in every way a national and global emergency. So this is an issue that transcends politics. And then a third assumption we've made is that this issue is one that is not an item on a list, but in fact the linchpin that connects every item on the list. And if we get climate change and energy policy right, we'll get lots of other things right as a result. We'll get security right and equity and economic development right and so forth. But this is not an issue that is uh, simply one of a lot of other things. And if you get this one right, we'll work our way down that list. No, climate change and energy policy are the linchpin that connects those items. There's another assumption we've made. Uh, do you remember the movie uh, Jack Nicholson, A Few Good Men? And he's Tom Cruise, the young JAG attorney. You remember the film? Uh, and Cruise says to Nicholson, there's been a murder on a, a Marine base, and Cruise says to Nicholson, I just want you to tell me the truth. And Nicholson, in the, uh, the photograph here, Nicholson says, you can't handle the truth, and he spits the words out. And there's a certain pedigree for that view that humans, as T.S. Eliot once put it, can't handle much reality. And so the way we would treat people with this issue of climate change is to tell them uh, what somebody's phrase is happy talk. You know, screw in a compact fluorescent light bulb, buy a Prius, build a green building, and all will be well. And that isn't the truth. That's not what the scientists are, by and large, telling us. There's another view here, and it's depicted by Winston Churchill, as the bombs are falling in uh, uh, London in 1940. Uh, Churchill didn't tell the British people, hey, uh, you know, we can beat Nazis at a profit, or <laughs> what a terrific opportunity for urban renewal. <laughs> Although it was, and they blew it. Uh, but that's a whole other matter. Churchill's response was, I don't have anything to offer you but blood and toil and tears and sweat. And he summoned the British people to heroism. And so between these two perspectives, we've decided that the President's Climate Action Plan has got to be about the, as, the, as clear and as true a vision of the science of climate change as we can possibly muster. And some of that is going to be unpleasant, but that's just the truth as best we can understand it. This is a, a graphic that shows uh, the variety of climate uh, proposals out there. This is business as usual, and this is a series, each of these down here. You can go to the website and download this particular graphic. but. Uh, this is a series of assumptions about how much carbon we have got to remove. This is our proposal after uh, a lot of consideration. We've got to go to 80 or 90 percent carbon reduction by 2050. It really does need to be front-loaded so a lot of the emissions occur early on. But you can compare uh, a variety of plans. I think the science is slowly pushing everybody in this direction. I was on the phone the other day with um, a couple of national figures and their Assumption is that we'll have to go to 100% carbon reduction by 2050. That the science is shoving us in a direction we'll have to simply balance the carbon books, no net carbon in the atmosphere. Um, this is a uh, graphic uh, uh, from Rob Sokolow and uh, Stephen Pacala, which a lot of you have seen. It, it, it takes this big issue of carbon uh, reductions and uh, divides it into a series of wedges. Each wedge is about 25 billion tons of carbon reduction in total by the year 2050. And so there are a variety of options here uh, being discussed about this. 
And it's a handy way to think about the issue. How do we begin this long-term deflection downward? How much can efficiency take out and how much can solar power do and so forth? The main criteria for these are, are really, however, uh, pretty simple. Whatever we do can't cause other problems. And so if we're trying to eliminate carbon and we say we go to nuclear power, well, nuclear has a number of things I'll talk about in just a moment, but uh, that really is kind of problem switching because nuclear has its own suite and set of problems. And so the criteria here ought to be, first of all, that we don't uh, simply switch problems from one to another. And secondly, the criteria here our energy policy and climate policy really ought to solve lots of other things. How about a policy that speaks to security as well as climate stability and uh, renewable energy and other sorts of things? And thirdly, it's got to be technically feasible. Uh, what we do has got to be, if it's feasible maybe in 20 years or 50 years, it's simply too late to meet this uh, criteria that we, we really only have 10 or 15 years, maybe max, uh, in which to solve this issue. And then. The criteria here, the metric for success, really, again, is very simple. It is the amount of carbon eliminated per dollar spent. And so it's the same criteria that any businessman would have uh, for the expenditure of investment capital, but it's the amount, in this case, of carbon, not profitability, per uh, dollar invested. And then it's got to be deployed quickly. We don't have time to wait for something that might be uh, advantageous in 50 years and so forth. And then finally, uh, we would hope that what we do in terms of energy policy and climate is repairable and redundant and locally uh, accessible. So here's, uh, here's coal, and the argument is we have so much coal it's easily available, we can mine it. Uh, we've got, uh, it is said, 200 years of coal supply available. And, uh, and then you look at the life cycle of coal, and it raises a number of issues, not the least of which is what do you do with the ashes, and then can you sequester carbon, and I should have a question mark here. If you're on the East Coast and uh, uh, your energy comes from Appalachian coal, this is more and more the topography of coal mining in Appalachia. It's mountaintop removal, and what happens in mountaintop removal, you take the Appalachian Hills in this case, and you simply lop off the tops of the mountains and dump the, uh, the spoil into or what's called overburden, an interesting uh, term you dump the overburden into the valleys. And so this is about 1.5 million acres of Appalachian forest, some of the most fecund and beautiful uh, forests ever uh, on the planet, uh, and also one of the uh, great carbon sinks in the United States. Uh, we've covered over, or what has been covered over so far is about 1,000 or 1,200 miles of streams. Um, this is a graphic taken from Ed Masria. If we burn all the gas and oil and so forth, this is the forcing potential here. But if we burn all the coal, this takes us well past the point of uh, 450 parts per million. If we burn all the coal, we uh, begin to approach a figure of 1,000 parts per million CO2. That is utter and total disaster. This is uh, President uh, Bush and Vice President Cheney's energy plan. It is to build 150 coal-fired power plants in the United States, but if they're built, and operate to the end of their effective uh, economic lifespan, they'll emit more carbon, it is said, than we emitted as a nation from 1750 until about the year 2000. Ball game's over. We wouldn't survive that. And then there's this issue of carbon sequestration, the belief that we can take carbon either prior to combustion or after combustion and sequester this in deep geologic formations. And there are a number of questions about this. One is, can we do this? at a scale necessary for roughly uh, 600,000 uh, megawatt coal-fired power plants. Um, and, we, and frankly, we don't know. The study that MIT did last spring that was uh, uh, published by MIT Press uh, leaves the question open. Uh, they're optimistic, but it's going to take another decade or so of research to find out. But remember, we don't have that decade. And then secondly, can you hold carbon below ground permanently? And if you can't, what's the point of doing it? Thirdly, uh, we don't really know what the cost of carbon sequestration would be. The cost uh, is still a variable, but it would certainly drive the cost of electricity up from uh, 9 cents a kilowatt hour, give or take, as the national average, to 12 or 15 or 20 cents a kilowatt hour. We just don't know. And then the issue here is, is it cost competitive relative to the cheapest alternatives, which in this case would be efficiency and renewables? And then 
Uh, finally, there's this issue again that any good businessman would ask, how much does it take to get how much out? And so the energy return on investment of this, and we don't know how much energy would be invested in carbon sequestration and carbon capture. Well, how about nuclear power? There's a lot of talk about nuclear and we're, uh, nuclear being uh, carbon neutral and so forth. And so uh, in examination of nuclear power, this happens to be the, the photograph is of uh, the Davis-Bessey nuclear power plant uh, not far from where I live. I'm about 50 miles uh, as a sober crow would fly this. Um, I'm assuming that uh, inebriated crows would fly a sober crow straight. Uh, but I'm in the outer evacuation perimeter of this plant, and it came very close to a nuclear uh, or loss of coolant accident a few years ago. A workman leaned on a uh, uh, line going into the power, into the uh, containment vessel, and a chunk of the containment vessel broke off, uh, roughly the size of a diameter, say, of a football. Uh, and it turns out that it was a lot closer than anybody anticipated and a lot closer than the utility admitted. But here are the issues with nuclear power highly subsidized. It's the most subsidized energy form uh, in the world. There are still questions of safety. It isn't just charitable in Three Mile Island uh, and Davis Bessey. There are routinely regular uh, near accidents and so forth. The record, the safety record is not great. We're not told a whole lot about it, but from what we can find out, it's not very good. Thirdly, if you can make a reactor, uh, you are a long way toward making a bomb. So this is problem switching. And the problem in this case is uh, the question of uh, bomb material and nuclear proliferation. And then there's the question of cost. Uh, 1,000 megawatts of coal-fired electricity, again, relative to the next cheapest kind of thing that we might do. There's a question of net energy. And net energy, in this case, starts at the mining of uranium, enrichment of uranium, which we do at public expense, the operation of the power plant, the entombment of the reactor at the end of its effective lifetime. You don't just walk away from these things. You've got to cover them in concrete and keep people away from them. And then there's the issue of waste storage. And so the question here is not how much power the plant produces, but also how much energy it uses all the way through that, that cycle. And is this going to be net energy producer or not? And we're not, we're not told whether it is or isn't. And then the question of, uh, is this really carbon neutral? Well, it depends on what an economist would call the opportunity cost. If you had put the equivalent amount, that amount of money, into, uh, let's say, efficiency in renewables, how much carbon reduction might you have gotten? And if the answer is a lot more than you got with nuclear power, then it's pretty clear that nuclear on its own is not carbon neutral. And then there's waste storage and uh, the question of civil liberties, which has kind of disappeared from the public uh, dialogue. Uh, if you have a solar collector on your roof, the FBI is probably not going to keep a file on you. But if you've spoken out against nuclear power, they have some reason to keep a file on you and to keep track of groups that are anti-nuclear in the event that they might be uh, terrorist groups. So nuclear power in an age of terrorism and great concern, legitimate concern about terrorist attacks, nuclear power simply amplifies what is already an existing problem. And then there are issues here, I'll not go over this slide, but there is a question of what happens in the event of an accident, and we have insured nuclear power plants since 1957 uh, through an act called the Price-Anderson Act, so uh, utilities are protected against the upper level of disaster. And who pays? Well, you and I would pay for this. And then there are biofuels, and uh, biofuels are now the rage in the Midwest because uh, of subsidies for uh, corn ethanol. But biofuels raise other uh, and similar kinds of issues. And you can look at the, the options before us here. This slide just shows falling energy return on investment. If you uh, had invested in, uh, let's say, spindle top in uh, East Texas uh, in 1900, uh, spindle top returned about 100 to 1 for, or $100 for every dollar invested in it. And uh, so that was a pretty good return on investment. But over time, the energy return on investment has fallen. Even things that we like, uh, wind power and so forth, the energy return on investment will never again be what it once was for uh, cheap, portable fossil fuels. And biofuels in particular have a variety of characteristics. So the entire corn crop here, for example, equals only 12% of U.S. gasoline use. And that, of course, puts food and fuel in competition on scarce farmland. So again, there's no magic bullet solution here. There will be a series of solutions, but biofuels uh, on their own won't do it. And certain uh, biofuels like ethanol from corn won't do it at all. 
And then if we use farmland to grow fuels, we end up with issues that, uh, again, have ecological ramifications. Nitrogen uh, used to grow growing corn, it's a heavy nitrogen user uh, down the Mississippi and creates the dead zone off the mouth of the Mississippi and so forth. So there's a series of problems associated with biofuels. What options do we have? We've always had options. Uh, the Paley Commission report uh, in the early 1950s showed that we could get a substantial part of our energy from sunlight and efficiency, but we didn't follow that path. Uh, it wasn't because uh, the technology didn't exist or couldn't be developed. It was because it was outcompeted in halls of Congress and various kind of ways to subsidize. This is Amory Lovin's uh, uh, view of what the world might have been uh, based on an article in Foreign Affairs in 1976. And this is what Lovins described as the hard path. This is the, what he called the soft path. This is a lot of efficiency in caulk guns and duct tape and insulation and so forth. This is a lot of big power plants and a lot of capital investment. Uh, this is the line that Amory depicts that we've actually been on. We've more or less been on a soft path, but with lots more potential to move in that direction. What's the transition to a soft path look like? Well, it, it's fairly straightforward, nothing new here. It means efficient transport. It means taking the CAFE standards, as happened in the recent energy bill, bumping them to 35, but 35 miles per gallon is still well below what we can do. We can do a lot better than 35. Some of you in the audience drive Priuses at 45 or 50 miles per gallon. Uh, the uh, business page in the New York Times today describes uh, Toyota making a, uh, a plug-in hybrid that'll get upwards of 150 to 200 miles per gallon. So we have the technology to do a whole lot better than the current uh, CAFE standard even as raised. Can you build high-performance buildings? Well, the LEED standards and uh, the Architecture 2030 challenge. Can you make buildings powered by uh, sunlight that are zero carbon emitters? Uh, the answer is probably yes. Energy efficiency and distributed energy. This is windmills and solar collectors and micro turbines. We have uh, a distributed computing system, and for some of the same technological reasons, we'll have uh, before long, I think, a distributed energy system if the policy we follow is, is correct. Prices that tell the truth, and the big price here that is the lie in our society is we price carbon at zero up to this point. And so all the climate legislation is about getting the price of carbon right, either a cap and trade system or uh, taxation or some combination of both. And then begin to shift taxes so we tax things that we uh, really don't want, like carbon or toxic pollution, and we take taxes off things that we do want. Uh, and then ending subsidies, uh, worldwide uh, perverse subsidies uh, run some Norman Meyer study a few years ago showed that we uh, subsidize things we really don't want on the planet to the tune of about $1.4 to $2 trillion per year. Could we power the United States by sunlight and efficiency? A report from the uh, American Solar Energy Society two years ago showed that, uh, yeah, we, could, we have a good chance of doing that and that the country may be running out of oil. We, the oil production uh, or extraction peaked in this, uh, this country about 1970, but uh, we are an energy-rich nation. And what they did was to look at a whole variety of things, from geothermal to wind and so forth. The United States is an energy-rich nation. And the cost of the economics of renewables uh, are falling dramatically. Uh, every renewable is uh, uh, becoming much more cost effective and the technology is becoming much better. Uh, and the advantages of doing this, I'll not read this slide, but you can read it uh, as I talk about it, but the advantages of doing this are huge. There just is not a downside. Every item on this list was known in the 1970s during the debate, if you were uh, old enough to recall the debate that began with the uh, first Arab oil embargo of 1973 and between the second and 1979. This was known a long time ago. And the fact that this was known, that there are multiple reasons for efficiency in renewables, not the least of which it, takes, uh, it makes us uh, independent of Middle Eastern oil. It gets us out of the politics of that region uh, and saves us from a lot of other disadvantages, terrorism, or whatever else you'd want to, want to mention. But all of this was known. The fact it wasn't acted on, however, indicates a, a rather massive political failure. And then there's the issue of efficiency. This is uh, average household electrical use in the United States. This is California. We were moving, they were tracking together pretty much in the early years, in the 70s and 80s. What California did, however, was to disso dissociate profitability, decouple profitability from sales. And so utilities finally had a, an interest in uh, providing efficiency, not just selling more kilowatt hours. 
uh, as part of a national policy, could this work in the United States or other states? The answer is overwhelmingly yes. Um, and efficiency works in all kinds of different ways. This is a graphic that shows the average um, efficiency trends in uh, refrigeration. If you bought a refrigerator in uh, 1975, you bought a machine that used about 1,750 kilowatt hours of electricity. But state of the art now is about 200 kilowatt hours of electricity. Better machine, same size uh, uh, cubic uh, footage capacity, but a better machine and uh, cheaper, and so efficiency has dropped dramatically. You can easily go into a uh, a uh, Sears store or whatever and buy a, a machine that's around 300 kilowatt hours, although state of the art if you want to spend a bit more is, is 200. Uh, this is a, a one of two photovoltaic arrays at the Lewis Center at Oberlin College. Uh, this is about a 60 kW array. This is the cost curve for photovoltaics, again dropping dramatically, the market rising at the rate of about 40 percent per year. Uh, and you can see that in the United States we backed off uh, a commitment toward renewable energy. We were uh, driving the process uh, until a few decades ago, and then we leveled out. In the meantime, Japan uh, took the lead. This is uh, Sherrod Brown, our uh, new senator from the state of Ohio. This is the second array. This is a 100 kW array. Just after this photograph was taken, Sherrod asked me, where did you buy this equipment? And said, well, our choices uh, in the time we had to make the uh, decision were Germany on one hand, Japan on the other. Of course, the irony was not lost on him. A lot of the technology uh, necessary to uh, manufacture photovoltaics was developed 24 miles from this, where this photograph was taken at the NASA Glenn Space Center at the Cleveland Airport. But we pay unemployment checks in Ohio. We buy our high-tech equipment from overseas. This is the, uh, the Lewis Center. Uh, this is, as far as I can tell, is still the only entirely solar-powered building on the U.S. College campus. And uh, I'll not talk about the program, but this has uh, been largely uh, hyper-successful. Could we power the United States? Uh, with wind power. Well, here are some data from uh, NREL, all of you know about this. This is the Saudi Arabia of wind, and uh, four states, let me go ahead and I'll back off uh, just a second. North Dakota, Texas, Kansas, and South Dakota in that order have enough wind potential to provide the entire electrical budget of the United States. Now that doesn't mean we can move electrons to either coast easily, but that's something about the potential. Uh, as the technology has developed, we can harvest wind at slower and slower speeds. And so, could we power the United States by wind power? This uh, is a wind field near Bowling Green, Ohio, where uh, not far from where I live. This was thought to be a marginal investment. It's turned out to be actually a very good investment. So the utility in this case, AMP Ohio, is expanding this wind field and developing a second wind field nearby. The numbers here are from the Apollo project, but imagine aiming to create three million jobs and generate trillions of dollars of revenue. Imagine manufacturing wind equipment in the United States. One of the most successful businesses now in Cleveland, Ohio, an old Rust Belt city is a manufacturing of these uh, two or three ton gear boxes that sit on top of the, the wind turbines, these uh, boxes right here. Uh, but imagine not buying wind machines from uh, Denmark, but making them in the United States as we once did. Uh, the issue here is not just a, an economic issue. It really is not economics at all. The economics are persuasive. It isn't a technical issue. Do we have the capacity to power the country by sunlight uh, and wind and efficiency? And the answer is overwhelmingly, yes, we do. What we lack is the political commitment to do it. Uh, is the public uh, for this? Well, look at the numbers here. Invest in solar and wind, 91% support. Uh, and this is data from uh, 2002, so this is older, but mandate. Uh, not market development, but actually mandate efficient appliances 87%, buildings 86 cars 85%. This is a New York Times poll uh, from last spring, and again, you see the support is dramatic. Are we changing climate? 84% yes. Then look down here at the bottom item. The environment would be worse for our children. 57% say yes. How sad can that be? but we cannot reconcile or be reconciled with that. We've got to stop that and begin to change this. Is public opinion for us? This is a study came uh, from Yale. Again, this is a 75% level, but if you'll notice a whole variety of areas, there is a constituency emerging for doing something a whole lot smarter than we have been doing. And then finally, in terms of poll data, this is a um, uh, BBC UN poll from uh, data from 21 countries and showing that uh, large majorities, even in the United States, are ready to sacrifice, ready to be, but nobody's thought yet to ask people to sacrifice in order to build this different economy and avoid the worst of what could happen. 
Are we fated to heat the, uh, suffer the heat death of the planet? And the answer, my friends, is just overwhelmingly, no, we're not. This is a choice we make, by default or otherwise. Um, this is uh, some reading material. I'll skip over that for just the time being. Let me close with a couple of thoughts here. Posterity isn't really mentioned in the U.S. Constitution except in the preamble. And in the preamble, it's just mentioned in passing. But there is no case law on behalf of posterity. All those generations that will follow us. But imagine a standard that says no generation, no organization, no university, no town, no city, no country has the right to change the biogeochemical cycles of the earth or impair the stability and integrity and beauty of biotic systems the consequences of which will always fall on future generations as a kind of remote tyranny. And you can hear in those words, you can hear Thomas Jefferson and Aldo Leopold and Bill McDonough and some of you in this room. This is a matter first and foremost of rights. And that's what the PCAP project is, a, is about. Um, these are my uh, three grandchildren. And I put them on the screen uh, because they are real cute. But this is Lewis, Lewis is age eight. And uh, he just cracked his chin open, had to get eight stitches, but he's full of uh, fun and humor, and he's a great little guy, likes sports. He plays baseball and soccer and basketball, and he's told his dad, who was an all-state basketball player, that he's going to beat him one-on-one -on -one by the time he's 15 or sooner, uh, and I believe he'll do it. Uh, his sister Molly is uh, in the middle, and Molly is age five. Her New Year's resolution, I've told a couple of you this year, when asked what she wanted to do to make herself better in 2008, she said she was going to stop biting people. <laughs> but she thought it might take her the better part of a year to do that. Uh, Lewis, in response to the same question, told his dad, my son, who's an Episcopal priest, uh, that he just couldn't think of any way to improve himself, but he could think of a lot of ways mom and dad could improve themselves. <laughs> This is Ruby Kate. Ruby Kate is uh, two and a half, and uh, she is uh, very verbal. Her mom's an attorney, her dad's a computer uh, worker, and uh, these three kids are not only my grandkids, but the point of putting them on the screen is that they have no voice relative to the future that they will inherit. Their children, what we call posterity, have no standing. They have no voice unless we are that voice. Unless we are loud and clear, they have no rights relative to the world we're creating for them. The Fifth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution say that we can't deprive people of life and liberty and property without due process of law. But they have no due process that applies to posterity. And then finally, uh, a couple of thoughts. What does the politics look like? The president's climate action is about changing the nature of U.S. politics and global politics. One of my favorite books uh, and one of my favorite writers and people is Thomas Berry, the great Catholic philosopher and theologian. And Tom Berry, a couple of years ago, wrote a book called The Great Work. And no generation asked for its great work. Uh, those uh, farm guys uh, in 1860 didn't really want to go die in the battlefields of Antietam and Gettysburg and uh, Shiloh and such places. But that was the work that they took on their shoulders to do. It was to end the scourge of slavery once and for all in this country. That was their great work. Our great work, I think, looks like this. Number one, we've got to do the hard work of balancing the carbon books. We've got to end carbon as a free gift to industry and to private consumption. But we've got to balance the carbon books. Secondly, we've got to make a rapid transition to efficiency and to renewable energy. We know how to do this. This is not a matter of technology. It's not a matter of economics. It's a matter of willpower and leadership. Thirdly, we've got to create a global bargain. This is not something we can do in the United States alone. We've got to deal with all the world, and hopefully we can lead the world in this direction. But this will be hard bargaining. We've got 22 tons of carbon dioxide per person that we release down to two tons per person. And that means moving efficiency and renewables as rapidly as possible and making the kind of changes in, in lifestyle, a phrase I don't much like, it sounds too ephemeral, but we've got to change the way we live and the way we provision ourselves with food, energy, water, and materials. That's a design issue. 
And then I think we need a whole new way to think about our role in the world. The precautionary principle has more uh, cachet and power, let's say, in Europe than it does in the United States. We have to begin to think about how do we eliminate risk and exposure of risk? What is, what's it mean to be precautionary and cautious relative to technology? And then these words, humility, doesn't play very well in the United States and fairness and so forth, but we have to begin to create a very different approach. This in every way is an ethical issue. And then the uh, Howard Odom, who's one of the great uh, ecological uh, thinkers of the 20th century, died in the late 1990s, but Howard Odom and his brother Eugene were the more than anybody else, the fathers of uh, modern ecology. Howard and his wife Elizabeth, before, before he died, wrote a book called A Prosperous Way Down. We've got to begin to envision a very different world. I think the title is unfortunate, but it's a different way to think about prosperity. We've always known that growth, the growth economy, didn't make us happy. So we've seen growth go up like this, but happiness peaked and kind of leveled out about 1957. Isn't that interesting? And so is there a different way to think about how we become prosperous and what this world looks like? And, uh, it's a world of front porches and better uh, poetry leagues and baseball and coherent downtowns and local farms and better food. It, it does not have to be bad. This is not down, it's really kind of sideways. And then finally, let me close with this. I think this is a very different kind of political era. We're asking the President of the United States, the next President, inaugurated in January of 2009, to help lead us in a political renaissance, to see politics not as left versus right, conservative versus liberal, but to take on the national business in a way that brings us together around this great work. We have got to do this. And it's work that is both ethical, it's economic, it's technological, it engages everything that happens at a university or a college. But it is the politics of trusteeship. It's the politics of seeing ourselves midway between that distant past and that far future as trustees of this incredibly precious gift that came to us as life. Could we reorganize our politics around the preservation and protection and enhancement of life for as far out in the future as we can possibly think? Thank you very much. I think it's a good issue. For those of you who may not have heard the question, uh, my focus just on the supply side, how we create energy, and one on the demand side. Thanks, thanks for that question. I think that's very good. Uh, you know, there, there is a debate uh, emerging about consumption. There's a slow food movement, uh, there's also something called a slow movement, just slow everything down. Uh, and uh, there, there's something to be said for that. Uh, Betsy Taylor organized. Uh, uh, some years ago, a uh, kind of not an anti-consumption movement, but uh, well, yeah, it was anti-consumption too. And there's the uh, the shopping free day movement. I mean, there, there are a lot of people thinking about this, and I don't know that it's ready yet for prime time in the national debate. I don't know what would happen in a debate if uh, I don't know Obama or John McCain or somebody would say, "Hey, we've got to consume less." I'm not sure how that would go over. But eventually, you're exactly right, we have got to talk about this. And uh, I think it can be talked about in a way that is a quality of life issue. I think there are ways to envision everything just going to hell in a handbasket, climate change comes on us like a ton of bricks, and things fall apart, and you can't eat, and so forth. And that is a plausible scenario. On the other hand, what we're hoping with the President's Climate Action is we're asking the next President of the United States to exert leadership on this issue and help frame a very different future for us, help us understand what we have to do. And there's no big mystery here. I, I don't think there's, so I would take your, your point, and you know, to me, that's a, that's a world, again, of front fortunes.
coherent downtowns, less sprawl, fewer shopping malls, more bike trails, more local book clubs, uh, better baseball leagues. It's a, a world where we, is it nirvana? No. Is it nostalgia? No. But it's a world we know how to create. And if you look, for example, in the development market, the best uh, developments now are uh, downtown infill developments that mimic the old European cities where you have street level activity and you have uh, restaurants and stores and so forth, and people living above it, and, and pocket parks, and that's what people are paying for. That's what they want. People are hungry for community. And in a lot of ways, the shopping mall and consumption, or overconsumption, was a substitute for, uh, I don't know, community and friendship. But you, you all know that. There's nothing new. But I don't know that we're ready yet to have that uh, debate nationally. We didn't put that in the PCAP report, specifically. But I think that the pricing carbon uh, the cap and trade system or taxation will have the effect of driving up the price of virtually, well, a lot of things. I mean, it has a carbon footprint. It's going to become more expensive. So we'll, we'll get to this debate, but thanks for the question. I, I wish we were ready for that debate. David? Um, Taylor, let me just hand you the mic here. I'm David Eisenberg. Um, I'm director of the Development Center for Appropriate Technology in Tucson. And um, one of the things uh, that, that I was thinking about is that's little talked about in the realm of uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy is, is actually to understand what it costs to have non-renewable energy and, and energy deficient buildings and cars and all the rest of that, appliances. There's, there's research that you can find um, Rocky Mountain Institute and Hunter Lovins and others um, that shows that on average, in most communities, somewhere between 70 and 80 cents of every dollar spent on energy immediately leaves the local economy. So, if you just think about 75 cents of every dollar you spend essentially bleeding out of your community, what larger economic, local economic development engine could you imagine than actually creating the jobs and businesses to stem that, that bleeding and then to keep m much of that wealth in the local community. So we, we keep looking at what these things cost as though there's not a, an enormous cost to what we're all already doing. And there's, a, there's another thing which is the relocalization movement, which is not anti-globalization, it's, it's about really enhancing and redeveloping the capacity to meet local needs as locally as possible. Um, and those are things that I think fit in really well. And then the last thing I just want to put out there is <coughs> John F. C. Turner gave a really great and important definition of appropriate technology, which is that it's technology that ordinary people can use for their own benefit and the benefit of their community that doesn't make them dependent on systems over which they have no control. And I think if you look at these different approaches, including especially nuclear power and a lot of these centralized um, power systems, what you see is that they're basically taking control of, what, of our future out of community hands. Uh, thanks for that. I, I agree with that. I, I think the point is that we have options and we have alternatives. And a good bit of national policy now has got to be framed around the idea of opening up local creativity and desubsidize and taking money out of things that we really don't want and don't need. Um, you talked about problem switching, but isn't there also problems with you know, doing so on, on that larger scale in terms of the resources, the palladium or whatever, the stuff that goes into the photovoltaic cells and the toxic waste related to the producing of the solar cells and couldn't actually do so okay? You know, solar power on that scale, um, short of the long range future, putting things up, building it on the moon, putting it in orbit, kind of stuff. Oh, wow, next question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, there, there are downsides to everything. I mean, it's planet Earth and we're humans and, and so forth. And I, I think that what you're, you're, the point of your question, I think, is, is really good, and that is to be honest and do full cost accounting for everything. And not, not have a system where we say, ah, oh, it's solar, it's automatically good. I think on, on uh, toxicity of solar manufacturing, NASA uh, some years ago developed a, uh, 
a solar thing. I used to travel around in this. It was a little solar uh, piece made out of plastic. It was about the thickness of a uh, plastic placemat. And the top part, the top third, was PV material. The bottom of two thirds was storage. And uh, the, the technology for a lot of this has been done. And they took uh, great pains to make sure it was non toxic. And whether companies like Nano Solar and some of the new startups are going to generate non toxic uh, materials or, or not, uh, I don't know. I'm not an expert in that field. But the point you're making is a really good point, and that is uh, we do full cost accounting and uh, for everything. But we, we basically level the playing field, and that, that has not happened so far. The, uh, the Energy Bill of 2005 gave uh, the nuclear industry $13 billion in subsidies. And imagine what $13 billion would do uh, to promote efficiency. And I, and I think the first rule here is to value efficiency in all kinds of ways, to eliminate energy use by uh, use of direct sunlight, by uh, designing communities with proximity, and doing all the things that we know how to do, to simply eliminate the possibility of having to generate power in the first place. And, and all of you have seen there are a variety of studies that show that we can eliminate 25%, uh, 50%, uh, the biggest number I've seen is 75% of US uh, energy use is simply waste. And uh, whatever the number is, we, we know in fact that it's a very large fraction of the total. So anyway, thanks for the question. The, the point is really well taken. Yes, all the way in the back. You want to just stand up and be real loud? I think that you know, Nicholas Stern, for example, describes in the Stern Review the climate issue as the largest market failure in history. That's one way to think about it. But as a market failure, it is by derivation a political failure. The political system ought to regulate the market, ought to set the terms by which markets work. And so then you're real quickly into the issue of what happened or what has happened or what has not happened in U.S. politics. Um, and let me just mention two things. Now, I don't want to surprise anybody in the room. Number one is that uh, we have the best political system money can buy. <laughs> and that's an old Will Rogers line. Uh, but we, we've got to get it, if we want to get serious about sustainability at some point, we've got to say we're going to make the same separation between money and politics that we allegedly have between religion and, and government. And so we've got to simply have, we, we pay for elections anyway, why don't we just pay them out of the federal purse and outlaw contributions to uh, political campaigns? The Supreme Court, in its, uh, its wisdom, however, has said that political contributions are expression of free speech. And that is simply absurd. Uh, second, and related to that, uh, when Ben Bedekin wrote uh, his classic book in 1980 on the media in the United States, Media Monopoly, he complained that we only had 50 major media outlets. And now we're down to five, one of which is Fox News, which is an oxymoron. Uh, and so what the public hears is increasingly homogenized, dumbed down, and driven by the requirements of the market. So in the spring of uh, 2005, when the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Report came out, the largest assessment of the state of the planet ever done, a thousand or some scientists worked on that, some of you may be in the room. That, on the evening it came out, on the morning it came out, that was page eight, if I recall correctly, of the New York Times, and it got about six column inches. Guess what was page one? Terry Scheindahl. The fact the planet was dying, got page eight, six inches, she was front page news, as was that particular day, Michael Jackson. Um, and all of you in the room know a whole lot more about Anna Nicole Smith and Britney Spears that you need to know. And so 
the media has been largely taken over. If you look at right-wing media in this country, right-wing or, or talk radio, talk radio is 91% uh, by volume of time right-wing. And I would say right-wing, not conservative, because what, what, what passes now for conservatism isn't conservatism, it's merely recklessness. So uh, whatever your politics are, we, we need to have a political conversation about this. So what happened, or what has not happened, I think is largely political failure. And it isn't a right-wing or left-wing kind of thing. I don't believe it's that way at all. I think it's a failure across the board of the political system uh, to deliver what we need to do. And I think in the process, you know, the blame of the democracy falls on you and me. Uh, we're, we're the folks who make it go. And uh, we're the citizens who ought to be, but we've been more consumers than we have been citizens. We have not paid attention. But we've selected some pretty awful people to represent us in Congress. No names intended here. I mean, you, you know the names as well as I do. Um, am I optimistic about the future? Um, optimism is a prediction. Uh, pessimism is irrelevant. And so I'm going to stay in the ground, uh, let's call it hopeful. And, but hope is a verb with its sleeves rolled up. And it's always busy trying to change the odds. So I'm going to stay hopeful, partly because I've got three grandkids and a fourth on the way. But I'm going to be, I'm going to be as hopeful as I, I can be. Uh, E.F. Schumacher ended his uh, book, Guide for the Perplexed, by saying, you know, if I ask whether humankind can make it, and the answer comes back, no, well, I'm going to head to the bar and it's, you know, eat, drink, and be merry. Uh, if the answer comes back, yes, I can get complacent. He says, better not to even pose the question, just get down to work. And there's pretty good sense in that. So the work before each of us, the things that you can do as students, that you can do as faculty, administrators, and community people, uh, simply get down to work and do what's before you and don't pose the question. But for whatever reason, don't marinate in, um, in despair. But having said this, I think it is absolutely essential to have the courage and don't just blow off what IPCC is saying or the Stern Review or the climate science as, oh, that's just doom and gloom. Don't do that. We've got to have the courage to look at the issues, read the science, understand what it means, and act appropriately. And I think for me that means act with a sense of urgency about this. And direct someone so excited about being here at ASU is you're doing so much what a university ought to be doing. And the leadership here is really quite incredible. A number of you in the room are doing amazing things and beginning to hear you're now beacon for this larger dialogue about sustainability. But a final thought here is, you know, we, we don't do big dialogue kind of things very well. But I think we need to. Uh, one of the things we've, we've done in this President's Climate Action Plan is ask a couple of uh, speech writers, uh, uh, we've written speeches for George Bush and Bill Clinton and other people, but they, they know how to communicate to the larger public. We draft a couple of template speeches for us. I mean, how does a president, assuming the will to do it, how does a president reach our hearts? Uh, not just our pocketbooks. This is not, I think, the first uh, initiative that ought to be sold because we can defeat uh, the problems of climate change at a profit. We may do that, or some of us may do it. But this is, first of all, going to have to be a decision that comes out of the sense of our, our hearts and a commitment to life and the future. Uh, so it's going to call on us uh, for a degree of, I think, frankly, nobility. And uh, again, that's not left or right. And that's all of us are liberal and conservative at various times in our life and various issues. So it's not an issue that ought to be allowed to divide us on those, those grounds. Anyway, thanks for the question. Um, I think we have to um, break. There is a class in this room. Let's all thank David Art. <laughs> This presentation is brought to you by Arizona State University's Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability for educational and non-commercial use only.